Hi everyone. Something that uh, I have to do is acknowledge the, the, the funding for all this, or the, the people responsible for piling all this stuff on me, is the DIT and the, Na the National Research Foundation. They give me money to do research, for, to pay for things, and to pay people to do things for me. It's quite wonderful. So this is just trying to let you know that there, there, there's a lot going on with all this stuff that I'm busy with. Every time I sit down and think about this stuff, another question pops up, like, why am I even doing this? Or, like, what, do, what sense do I make of it? Mo most of this is going to just really tell you what this stuff is. I'm sure the other questions will come as part of that. But firstly, I wanted to show you where this stuff was. This is the view from my department, from the first year room. And this is where I'm going to try and go out and play you uh, this m Mkulu rank. Oh. That, that's just a normal everyday scene from from our department, and the 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 interesting place is inside there, inside there. That's a taxi rank, and there are all sorts of commercial activities in there. One of them is where one of the sandal makers works from, and then about that far, but back the other way is a place called Dalton Road, which is. Just on the side of the road, it's where the Zulu craftsmen make traditional dancing wear, they make shields, they make sticks. That's where I saw my first pair of sandals. I hope everyone has seen a pair of Zulu sandals. They're called Ezim Badada. I remember the first time I sort of heard something about Badada and I said to someone, do you have some Badada? And he said, P potatoes. <laughs> and you have to say Ezim Badada, otherwise it means something else completely. Anyway, so I saw, the, I saw the sandals being made and I saw the strips being cut and they were just wonderful. For someone that makes things with your hands, it's, it's amazing to see how the strip is actually produced. I found these straps, I could buy them for about 20 rand each or 30 rand each. The guy didn't really know what I wanted. I just wanted them because I thought they were amazing. I made some bangles, I, I felt I had to do something with them, so I made some bangles like this, just pop riveted some aluminium on the inside and showed the, my department has a table at the local market, similar to what the, the market is at Hout Bay. It's, not, it's a craft market more than a flea market. It's all handmade stuff and a, a little bit more upmarket. Anyway, so I had the stuff on a table there and a, a buyer from New York, uh, an internet selling company called Eziba, came past and he saw these bangles. He said, ah, oh, these are wonderful. Uh, how much are they? I want 500. How many can you deliver? And, and I said, oh, I'll, I'll get back to you. So um, I went back to uh, the cutters. This is one of the cutters. He lives at that rank that I pointed out to you just now. So I went and I tried to look for the cutters back at the Dalton Road. This was now about three to six months later, and they'd all gone back to the farm. And then I thought, oh, well, now I'd better find somebody else. And I found this old man, and he was the only one I could find at that stage. And then I tried to find some more rubber. Sort of found some, but not in any sort of quantity. I could get about one tire a week. So I, had to, I emailed a guy in New York, Leo Kreidelman, I think, and I said, I'm sorry, I can't guarantee any quantity, not, just not any. And then that became my mission. I set out looking for these cutters. So this, here I found Mkulu. You can see he's in his shop. There's all his stock of his tires on the right-hand side. That's him. Mkulu means grandfather, I think. My students just call him Mkulu. They, they don't know what his name is. And th this is showing his hands just cutting a pattern. That was the first strip there at the back. That was my first strip that I got from Dalton Road, and this is the pattern that Mkulu cuts. Anyway, so that order fell through, but then fortunately I did have another bangle that I made from number plates. I picked up a number plate, made some bangles from it, and this guy from Eziba saw those and he fell in love with them as well. So fortunately I had another order that I could deliver and that I sold, I don't know, about 500 of these to them. I don't know if you remember when the rand was 14 to the dollar. Now I sold these, I got the order when the rand was 5 to the dollar and then he put in the, the order and then when I got paid, he paid me at 14 rand to the dollar. So I just made lots of money because he paid me in dollars. So he just sent the dollars through and I just that translated into lots of rands, which was very nice. That was the one positive thing that came out of that experience. But then in my search for these rubber cutters, I then, I have a research assistant, that's him there in the middle, that's Dominic. 
Stokosa. And he told me about this old man living near him. That's Mr. Dlamini. He knew of this old man that cuts rubber, so he'll go and talk to him. So I went to see Mr. Dlamini. It actually turned out that he was the man that made that first pair of sandals that I showed you. When I went there, I just saw in the shed there, I saw lots of strips that had been cut lying there. And they were actually for an order that Dlamini was busy doing. He sells his sandals all the time. He, he has more orders than he can cope with. So he just cuts strips. This, this is a close-up of what they look like. I was quite amazed. Those are the soles lying there ready to be cut. Those there. But then he, he became a bit elusive. He, he didn't need my money. He didn't quite know what I wanted. It, it became really difficult to get stock from him. But I sort of had him on hold. I, now at least I had two cutters. Then I found, found Tembing Korsi at the beachfront. He was, this photo is taken in my office, not at the beachfront. I saw him cutting there and I started talking to him and gradually ordered some strips from him. Together we made, one, we made this piece for, it was for Absolute Vodka, it was a promotion in the Cosmopolitan, where he cut the rubber. I had to help him, I had to sort of help him to get this, the shape of the Absolute Bottle right. And then I did the beads and the, the settings. I had to submit a proposal for, for doing this. And this was just my Photoshop drawing with Tim Binkorsi's first efforts, those bottles there. I, I thought he understood exactly. I said, you know, now cut the rubber, some patterns, and put some nice bottles all in a row. And he took artistic license and did bottles like that. So then I had to cut it like this and show him, no, do it a bit like this or a bit like that. And then this is just a photo that I took of that necklace, which is now somewhere here in Cape Town, I think. This was part of the process, um, just showing how to cut it from the tire. We had workshops with Tim Benkosi where he came into the department. He, he taught us how to cut. He, he showed us all the ins and outs. We had no idea really how to work. That there, that's Bongi, Bongi Nkosi. He was one of my fourth year students at that time. And this is Professor Joan Connolly, who's an oral. No, she works in the oral tradition. She. Um, sort of anthropology, but she, she runs lots of workshops for us. And those are all the samples that he's showing us how to cut. This was when we tried to cut. There, that's my pattern there. That's Professor Connolly's pattern. That's everyone, everyone trying their hand at it to see um, how difficult it is. And then at the end of it, Bongi, for his BTEC, for his fourth year research report, he made this drawing which really summarized the process. It just shows that you start with your tire like this. It has to be a white wall tire. And then your, your first cut is where you remove it like this, and your second cut you do there, third cut, etc. He has a whole research report linked to this. But this drawing was just the most amazing summary of the whole process. All of a sudden we understood how you could use drawing in the department as a visualizing tool, much better than photos and videos. You can't demonstrate this with a video. And then those are the patterns. Anyway, then we found Mpungos close to Dlamini. I thought this was a really nice photo with him and his chicken. He doesn't cut too well, but he's reliable. I can, I can order some strips from him. He makes these sandals are quite nice. And then we went closer to, closer to Tech. This is the station just around the corner. And can you see there's a speck there? Those are, that's a pair of sandals there. That's a pair of sandals. I'll show you. And then just above the sandals, there's some orange there and there's some people sitting there. And this is Dominic, my research assistant. So we find these people in the station just... We, when you start looking, you find them everywhere, but you, you don't realize it. You kind of never walk through those alleyways. This is a video I don't really have to show you. He's just busy hammering. That's just the sound around there. He's just hammering a nail into the sole, putting the sand strap onto the sand. And then a bit for about 50 meters further, there was Samson who also made sandals. I'd like to try and show you this video because it... Um this is just the area where these traders are and where we find them. That's Gray Street down there, down there.
I take my students on a walk through here. Every year we go for lots of walks there. And nothing has ever happened to us, no. And every time we go there, we discover something new. And then while we were busy talking, this Tom Zo came past. Look at the nice pattern that he cuts on the soles. He cuts really beautiful patterns like that. And I, then I went to see him at his shop where he sandals, where he sells his sandals. He, in the meantime, he's changed, he's Zimbabwean. He's changed his surname to Gumede or Tlamini, something more Zulu so that the people would buy his stuff, you know. There was an article on him in the newspaper and I recognized him, but I didn't recognize his surname. And then these are the products that I've made or developed from the rubber strips. Those are just some of the recent strips that I got. I submitted these to Schmuck, which is an exhibition in Munich. I submit stuff every now and then, and then I think these were accepted last year or the year before. What was really nice is what the sh was that the show was curated by Hermann Junger, who was my idol as a student, and he just, I don't know, I like the fact that he liked it. But they weren't, they're not wearable, it's just me busy dabbling with a, a material, a, a, that I feel has a lot to it. And then last year, did some stuff for Fashion Week where I just did the sort of very obvious things with it, just making it into uh, bands, bangles, things like that. These are the latest bangles. I, I, I was it sounded like I was starting to say, ah, oh, just bangles, but th these, these are the ones that we did last week. It's the latest development where instead of cutting through the black to get to the white, we cut just into the white and it just becomes much more sophisticated. And the same with the key rings, also a very late development. Initially I just took off cuts and just put some loops on them. And then after having bought a, a thing for putting in studs and so on, I could put studs in like this. And all of a sudden I'm starting to get to more cultural, ugh, more three-dimensional, richer shapes that I, I'm not sure where it's going to go. And then the earrings. Initially, the first earrings that we did, like those ones, were where you, you cut on the... I used those strips. Now, with these earrings, I use that little strip that gets cut. Now, when that little strip gets cut, it just gets thrown away. It's not... They don't use it for anything. And then I just thought that it could be really beautiful if I used it as the material itself, just white rubber. And someone said, oh, but this looks like ivory, or it looks like... And actually, it's a piece of old car tire. And then these beads that I started using, I sort of looked at them, and the Sangomas you normally wear them across their bodies. And they sort of have amuletic um, qualities to them. And then I heard that, no, 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 they're used for tea. They're called teething beads. I'm, tr I'm still trying to find out their real name. Someone calls them Mfibenga, Job's Tears. And they, they're teething beads. And I, I thought, oh, but aren't these poisonous for children to chew on? And she said, no, they, they don't chew them. They, they tie it around their waist for the time when they're busy teething so that it can just add some extra protection. So it feels like there's the makings of a really interesting body of jewelry. And then this is just a, something that happened along the way. Sort of Zulu love letters crossed with tires. And you're working in a, in a process where you're taking the top layer away. And this is if you use Guinness cans. If you use um, black label or any other cans that have black on it, they rust because they're made from steel. But Guinness is made from aluminium. So it doesn't rust. So they, it just feels like there might be a, a new medium opening up there. And I, kn I know about the eye. It's not the eye that's missing. It's more, there's something, I'm, do, I'm involved with this and it just, there are too many questions that are, I, I, I have misgivings about what I'm busy with and how I'm doing it. And part of it can be personified by another video that I have to show you. This is the, the passage just outside uh, my department. The department is down through those doors there. The aim of this one is that now you turn left and you look through the window and in the park, there's a bare patch of ground. And every Tuesday and Thursday, the, the whole aim, what I want to do is I want to show you the richness of, or the, there's, there's an aspect around me that is really rich and I feel that there's more being offered than is being made of it. So that's why I'm talking about the Shembe. The Shembe is a religious group of Zulus in and around Durban. And on Tuesdays and Thursdays, they practice in the park. This is them, that's the Technicon. The, the Shembe have this elaborate dances that they do. 
they um, elaborate headdresses, they do wonderful beadwork, and they, um, they're all around Durban. So I started going to them, and I worked with a, one of the beadworkers. This is one of the beadworkers, and the, what the Shembe, they wear, the, um, they have these panels of beadwork that they wear around their head. So, and the, the Shembe color sensibility is just amazing. You, you can't imagine that, that it really works putting some of those colors together, and it's very elaborate. So I started working with this woman. Her name is Tembani. She has also passed away recently from, uh, I think, from TV as well. We, we, we went and we tried to develop a range of jewelry based on Shembe beadwork, and it took us probably about a year, and we arrived at necklaces like these. That necklace there, which is also, it's done in Shembe colors. It's a pattern derived by that woman. And then one of the necklaces sold, which to us was quite amazing. Last year, I brought it to the design in Darba. You can see them there. There's some of the rubber, some of the rubber stuff and some of the beaded stuff. And it was just such a rich experience. It was an amazing thing to go through. But there was absolutely no interest in it. it could, maybe it's political. I'm not sure. But uh, it was very deflating. We just kind of stopped all the beadwork work with that woman because there was no interest. It could be that there was a craft work right next door, lots of beadwork, but it's almost as if people have blinkers when they, when they think beads, they think of it in a certain way. It goes on a piece of wire or something. There's no, no, not enough substance there. So this really just brings me to the end where I just say, like, really, I'm not, I'm not sure what is busy going on here. Do you think I'm overstressed or perplexed or confused for no good reason.